stems from the realization that our emotions taint our reality and and focuses on creating spaces that mirror our psychological state. While their work is grounded in reality, they, they strive to install a sense of surrealism and Lyman in their images. And after I read that, the first thing I did is I went and I looked up Lyman. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I've heard. I, I, I have an. I had an idea what it means, but I, 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 I want to hear why you chose that word. Uh, for me, I'll tell you what I think. I, I think it's like it's a stimulus, um, uh, of, 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 of a way to stimulate the the, the senses. Is mm-hmm. that is? Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, the sort the Lyman. I also didn't really know what it means. I just, but I felt it fit my what how I wanted to describe my work the best, which is just that it has a feeling of neither reality nor like surrealism. I just wanted to be somewhere in the middle, where it kind of like lays somewhere in like the middle ground between reality and um whatever else. Yeah, well, the, the thing I felt quite interesting about it was like it initiates a response and initi- initiates a, a stimulus of some sort, and 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 I think that's that's a that's why I read it because I think that's a great way to describe what you do. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Catherine' success has been just amazing over the last seven. I'm going to say, um, not even seven years, five years. Um, how long have you been in New York? When, what year did you move move to New York? I moved right after graduation, so in two thousand seventeen. Seventeen, okay. So I'm pretty pretty correct. Six yeah. Or seven. Um, uh, their work has been in three by three, Society of Illustrators, uh, American Illustration, Communication Arts, Applied Arts, Creative Quarterly, all of the things that we want are where we want our work. Uh, <laughs> So kudos to you. Uh, some of the, the featured clients are Criterion Collection, The New Yorker, uh, The New York Times, Mondo, Folio Society, Chronicle, Rolling Stone, all the people we all want to work for, you know, <laughs> all the venues we all want to work for. So again, congratulations. Um, Thank you. I, I have to, I'm going to come at this a little bit differently because I have a, 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 a point of view. First, first of all, I love what you do. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I have the opportunity to teach classes with you every once in a while for you to come into study hall and get to communicate with students, get to, get to, get to listen to you explain and help others with their work, which I think requires a tremendous amount of knowledge about picture making. And you do it as well as anybody I've done it with. And, and. I just can't figure out how you learned it all so fast <laughs> because, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I, I've been doing this for 30 years, basically teaching mm-hmm. uh, with you know, almost 30 years with some of the best people that ever worked in the industry. And I, and, and you don't miss a step. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to me. And I, I kind of leave a, a little bewildered of how you put all that together. Um I'm a, I have a, a body of work that I, I chose, which is basically your website. I just, I mm. grabbed images and I want them. You don't have to talk about any particular image. Um, it might be fun uh, for us to, uh, you know, have things just going by, <laughs> uh, images going by. If there's something you, uh, in particular piece you want to stop on and talk about, you're welcome to. Mm. Uh, I I want to I want you to give kind of a little bit of an idea of background. I met you in 2016 at the Illustration Academy. I uh, think so. That was yeah, I, 2016. Wow, that was a while ago. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And it's it's amazing. It's coming up on seven years um, and eight years, uh, mm-hmm. getting close. And um, I I want first of all. You know, I always ask questions about interests and and how you got into this, mm-hmm. and you know what was what was it like as as a child? What you know, what kind of environment were you in? What what you know, what kind of support you got from your family, from your parents? Um, what uh, 
what did you like to do as a child? Yeah, well, as a child, I actually did not like drawing at all. My mom had enrolled me in this like Sunday weekend like hobby art class where I would go to um this lady's basement and I would just draw like copies. I would just copy existing paintings of like still life. And that kind of went on for like a couple of years. And I went up to my mom and I was like, mom, please, I hate this. Let me go. So she um eventually like agreed to like just kind of let me stop going to that art class. So I never really had an interest in art until I like went to middle school and started like watching cartoons and watching anime, reading manga, watching movies and all that kind of stuff. Just being like exposing myself to all the types of art that exists in on the internet and I think that's actually where I got my was actually truly inspired to create art was like through watching cartoons and reading manga it wasn't through copying still life off of like in some lady's basement it was very much just seeing what other people were making seeing like the kind of just work that people were creating outside of very like um imaginative really creative stuff and I just wanted to follow their footsteps and create something on my own as well I think it's pretty common for um whatever's accessible you know for for somebody that's yeah that's developing you know whether it's comics or children's books or um uh, cartoons you know mm-hmm. I, I, animation I think I think people look at that and they're like, they're interested in it. They don't really understand that somebody's making it. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's like, they don't, they're not sure where it comes from, but they, but they like to copy it. Uh, They like to, they, they, they just get invested in it. Yeah. And and I, I, again, I I think that's interesting that how uh, the rebellion with the classes (laughs) and, and kind of, kind of leaning towards pop culture. It really was a rebellion because my mom wanted me so badly to be a doctor and focus on my studies. And all I ever did instead was just watch cartoons and draw (laughs) on the back of my homework. Well, maybe maybe that was her purpose. It's like, I'm going to make these art classes so boring that (laughs) that that Catherine's going to throw in the towel early. Unfortunately, my mom. It took a while for my mom to support my um, decision to want to be an artist. She um, initially was so hesitant that she asked me one day, she like practically begged me, like, are you sure you can't go into law? Are you <laughs> sure? <laughs> and I, so, um, but recently, ever since um, my Instagram follower count has gone up, I think she was like, oh, okay, this is a real career, but <laughs> It's I it's been difficult and I feel like a lot of people can relate just um how like sometimes parents can't they're supportive but they're just concerned and with every right to be concerned because it is a very like fickle field to be in but I mean yeah it's very it's nice to know that like despite all the wild twists and turns my career path has gone through my mom is still supportive um have uh like what were what were the first artists that you recognized you know that that you started to identify yeah I was in love with Soroya when I was in high school I looked saw his work once and I just thought that it was so beautiful because of the way he was able to capture sunlight and that was something that I tried to emulate in a lot of my early work was just being able to capture light and the sense of light that came from it and the feeling that like you he evokes in his paintings that's a if anybody in the audience doesn't know it's Joaquin Soroya just a magnificent painter uh had huge influence on a lot of artists and myself included um but a facilitation that very few have ever achieved um Anyway, that's that's kind of an interesting. That's, I mean, so you discovered uh, Soroya fairly when you were pretty young. Yeah, I think I discovered him from like Tumblr or something. But yeah, his work just captivated me, 
And from there, I started looking into like other illust not illustrators, but just painters like Sargent. I was really into just like the impressionists. I think everybody's into the impressionists. Everybody loves the impressionists. And they should be, right? Yeah. <laughs> So um, this this piece was my first piece for I ever made for Criterion. I um shed so many tears over it. I <laughs> cried day and night <laughs> because I was so nervous. <laughs> but well, it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry to hear it was painful to do it, but uh, it was worth it. It's an amazing piece. Oh, thank um, you. Such, I mean, your application of under understanding how design works and applying it to a narrative is just phenomenal. Um, the, uh, so, but, you know, so when you, like, when you were in high school, had you already had, I mean, you obviously went to art and design college. I know where you went, you went mm -hmm. to painting. Um, but did you, that conversation that, you know, obviously your parents agreed to, you know, send you there. Mm -hmm. So there was mutual agreement at that point. Um, it, 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 did that, did the support start then? I mean, was it, uh, you know, was it, was Ringling a testing ground for you? Was it? Uh... Yeah, I was. Um, so I started to actually very seriously take like illustration as a career path. Um, sort of when I was in like, high school, like in the middle of high school, it took a lot of convincing of my parents. When I first told them, they, um, I told my dad when he was driving and you know, like what they, you know, when parents, like they hear bad news while they're driving, they just stiffen up and they like grip the steering wheel real hard. And you can hear it like crinkling <laughs> under their fist. Um, yeah, like my parents were not excited <laughs> at all for <laughs> my decision. And actually, um, but I, just like on my end, I knew that I could not do anything else. I knew anything else that I would be forced to do, I would be so miserable doing it. And I knew that art was the only thing I ever would ever put effort and enjoy. So I stubbornly actually like told my mom that I, after I got accepted into Ringling, I stubbornly was like, this is the school I'm going to. I don't care what yet what anybody says. Like I'll pay on my own pocket, out of my own pocket. I'll do everything. And um, so it was sort of like a testing ground. And when I got got there, my mom was so um my parents were just so nervous for me that like I guess it translated to like my own anxiety. So I just like spent as much effort as I could trying to like be the best as I could during school. Well, you, you, I met you right before you graduated, um, and you were extremely good. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, beyond, uh, uh, above and beyond what both students accomplished. Um, so after Ringling, you did something that is not right for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. You kind of, uh, I, you know, it was funny, I, I had this uh, conversation with I was talking about uh, Scott Anderson and Sterling Hunley, and and they both went through the academy at the same time, and they had very different trajectories of their careers. Of so one took a path where it was much slower teaching and developing them, oh, and they, they kind of ended up almost in the same place of of you know all these high end projects that they're getting now. But Sterling, I, I made the uh, the suggestion to Sterling, I said, I think the term I used was you, you just kind of dove in and put your fo foot in the water right away and tried to become, you know, a working illustrator right at, as soon as you walked out of school. And he said, John, I would, I would rephrase that. He said, a better analogy is I kind of threw myself off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 so, and I think you and I've had that discussion a little bit. To talk about that a little bit, because yeah. I think it's really interesting that, I mean, you pick, you pick the toughest town where the the best of the best work, and you committed to it. Yeah, you know, I I totally agree with Sterling. It's not just like, oh, I put my foot in the water. It really is. <laughs> I jumped off a cliff into a storming sea, because like, 
I think when we're that age and we just graduated college, we're full of ambition, you know, and we kind of for, and also we're so young that we just kind of forget like all the serious things that come along with like doing make a making a decision like that. But no, yeah, um, no, um, when I was young, I mean when I was in college, I so desperately. I, I don't think I cared about much else except for success because like I had I and mean, maybe like some other people can relate with this but my parents paid for my school so I had a sense of responsibility or a sense of depth that I felt towards my parents feeling that like oh if they spent so much money towards my education I should turn around and you know at least find success with it and I went to the illustration academy. I learned about editorial and just like, just got full of myself in my head. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll go into <laughs> editorial too. And yeah, I just recklessly without really thinking moved to New York, one of the hardest towns, as you said, to be in one of the towns with the biggest competitors, uh, crazy rent, crazy living expenses, and just thought that if I were able to plunge myself into like without not even just like put my foot in the water, if I would, my rationality was that if I plunged myself into like freezing water, I would get used to it sooner. Hmm. You know, like I could take my time and slowly dip into the water until I'm used to it, like one inch by a time, or I could like fully just throw myself in and then immerse myself and then, deal with it later and that's the decision I went with was to well, just fully fling myself into the void and then just deal with it later 100 <laughs> percent commitment I I did a very similar thing um I you know and it was I was you know I, I always felt like it's maybe too dumb to know any better but the I just thought that I could make it work and um you have to have you have to have a quite a bit of belief in yourself to do that um and i and you made it work that i and i and i know you had to have at times be like did i make the right decision <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> was that a good a good choice um I, I i would it was a good choice for you i mean it, at least from my perspective because we all get to look at these beautiful pictures that you made um, and it all happened so quickly. Uh, be before I ask another question, before we go on about this, can you explain this assignment what, or what I'm looking at? Oh, yeah. So this is for the New York Times. So they had hired me for the annual kids section comic issue. I think every year the New York Times, like around July or August, they release for the kids section, they release a comic issue where every every single page in the newspaper is a comic. And so they had asked me to do the middle spread for the COVID edition that year. So it was about three kids who had to migrate and them and their family had to migrate because of COVID. And who better to draw such a depressing scenario than me, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are gonna be a lot of shadows. Yeah, uh, a lot of shadows, a lot of sad figures. <laughs> um, there's a question here from, from a, a student from Ocean. Um, do you recommend jumping off the cliff for most people or is that dependent on multiple things? It is dependent on multiple things because I had like the chance to see, I, me and my partner at the time, my ex, like we both dove in head first and jumped off the cliff. And it was funny to watch because we were of, I like to believe we were of equal talent at the time. We did the same exact thing. We applied to the same people. And, and for some reason, like, it just didn't click for her like it did, did for me. So, and I think that it comes, there's a lot of factors that come into it. Like some people, like, it could just be that the timing is off, that like their portfolio wasn't just, just wasn't there enough or maybe it's like they were so anxious in the beginning while they were working that they weren't able to produce their best work but um yeah I think that like I mean 
I like to think that I'm very lucky that jumping off the cliff for me actually did work. But I know just from like my experience seeing other artists and how they struggled really hard to get to where they are now, I would I wouldn't recommend that for everybody. Everybody goes about it different ways. I don't think that there is one wrong or right way. I just think that sometimes like sometimes you just get lucky and sometimes you don't. Hmm. Well, it, that's interesting because I I do a lot of like interviews or portfolio consultations or uh, like ca- career um, uh, discussions with people, and I always I always tell people that you have to look at it. You have to look at all. There's a lot of mo- there's a lot of moving parts here, and you have to look at it all. You can't. You can't expect 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 to succeed if you don't take care of. It's not just making artwork, you know. It's like, does this fit me? I mean, do it? Do I have the right timeline? Do I have enough, you know, financial backing to make this work? Um, am I in the right location? There's so many things that that you can trip up on and fail that you have to consider that I don't think a lot of artists really completely consider when the, when when they're developing. Um, they yeah. kind of they kind of learn the hard way, you know. I I um, I, I said this in a in a talk I it was with an individual today, and I say it a lot to people. Um, I said that the, my dad used to jokingly say this about helping young artists, and he used he used to always say that the two biggest killers of careers are are finance and romance. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and again, it's like you got to get all there's a lot of things you got to get together when you're when you're when you're getting coming out of school or you're just starting uh as an emerging artist that so many things that people don't think about. And um it all kind of comes at you and how you how you handle it in kind of a really unique way of making a living um, oh yeah it can be different in our industry um it's kind of, it's pretty small um most people know who everybody else is to a certain extent that and and then they pay attention to, to 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 you know what everybody else is doing as part of part of the industry and then just knowing how it works can be really confusing Mm-hmm. Um, you pr- you probably learned a tremendous amount about the industry in the first couple of months that you didn't you weren't prepared for coming out of school. Yeah, not at all. I um did not know how to send an invoice. I didn't know what the fucking invoice was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, like, I don't know, just like the idea that someone would possibly pay me money like blew my mind. So I was accepting jobs for nothing. <laughs> because I was just like you would pay me to draw something that's crazy <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah I learned so much in the first couple it's a lot of trial and error it's a lot of falling on your face and then having to just get back up like brush it off the mud and just get back up because like it's such a it's such a difficult field especially if you decide to freelance it's so fast and it's so difficult and like you're basically plunging your you a novice is basically are basically plunging yourself into a machine that hasn't stopped for you so you're either gonna have to just like slowly work your way up to catch up with that machine or you're just gonna have to plunge yourself into it and I feel that like that you learn a lot just by being thrown around that machine a couple of times (laughs) yeah well, yeah, the, hard, the school of hard knocks, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, one thing I did want to bring up, you talked about really identifying the the editorial market, and my my opinion, and that's that's what I did. That's what many of our academy students uh, have done uh, that have become real successes. Many of our VAP students that focus on. I truly think it's a great place to start because it. It kind of has the lowest barrier of entry, um, except you twisted that around a little bit because <laughs> a lot of the editorials you were looking at were the best editorials. You know, it's like uh, you were looking at Rolling Stone, you were looking at The New Yorker and um, really high end editorial. 
Um, so much of the editorial world, Dale Stefanos mentioned this many times, you know, uh, uh, who, who is a very successful editorial illustrator, uh, mentions that most of the venues in the magazines he works for are magazines uh, most people never heard of before. They're, they're university magazines, they're medical magazines, financial magazines. Um, so tell me, tell me about your choice. Why editorial? Yeah, I, so when I was in college, I actually really wanted to go into animation and do visual development. I didn't really care too much about like, I didn't even know what editorial was. And I, clearly didn't care for it because I thought it was just like clip art. So I like looked over that and I tr focused all my energy into visual development, but it just turned out that visual development wasn't what I had imagined in the first place. I had imagined that it was a lot of sort of really cool scenes that you see in like the concept art books, but it turns out it's just a lot of like designing rocks and trees and I just was not into it. So I, when I went to the illustration academy, I had came across at the at that year I went, Victor Lai was here. And she went into a very in-depth explanation of what editorial really was. And on top of that, there was like Edward Kinsella, Jeffrey Allen Love, Sterling Hunley, uh, all these people who just worked in editorial. And I just realized how big of a market and how like versatile editorial could be. I think a lot of it was just mis miseducation on my part in the beginning. But once I understood that like this is a viable market and like one that a lot of people thrive in. I realized that like I could, you know, spend the rest of my life like competing against others and try to get a position at a company or I could fully take a lot of the control into my own hands and sort of dig my way up through that. So, which is why I chose editorial in the first place. I just figured that like, I'm a control freak too. I love control. And like, I just felt like if I had more control over my own career, I could just do more with it. Well, um, you made the right choice, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting that um, editorial, editorial is also, it's a part of the industry that so many people look at. I mean, it's very visible. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there's something about, there's still something about that. Oh, wow. Being in a magazine, being on the cover of a magazine or that that's, that's, that's thrilling. I mean, that, that and that's seductive. Um, but it is, it's also a place. And as I mentioned, all the, and, and the, many of these same artists you just mentioned, they, it, it was the beginnings, the first place, and they were able to broaden their career within the few, few first few years started working in different parts of the industry. It's like they, they, they cut their teeth, they got a little notoriety and then, Oh, I'm going to approach the publishing world. You know, I, I, I get a big kick out of, you mentioned, you know, visual development artists and you think of the great Peter DeSev, um, Peter DeSev, you know, most people that know Peter DeSev now know him for his character design. You know, he designed, you know, ice age characters for Pixar. Um, it, it, the guy's done so much work for the New Yorker. He was he was an amazing editorial illustrator first, that went into the publishing world and then just kept kept going. You know, it's, it's like doors keep opening from 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 the beginning of the of of that editorial market. And I'm I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but it it is a great starting place that will can give you. Um, uh, can get can get you some notoriety that it makes it easier to move into different parts of the industry. Um, and so now, what am I looking at right now? So this is a piece that I was commissioned for by Folio Society. Um, it was part of a, I think, a anthology, I think. And I was part of this book that had 27 other illustrators. This piece specifically was for Philip K. Dick's a short story I can we can remember it for you wholesale it was, it's all, all about memories and fragmentation and fake memories real memories repressed memories it's a really funny story but yeah I just wanted more than anything I just wanted to make a pink illustration because I thought it would be very very cute 
Well, I think it's interesting because you start, you know, this isn't, you know, the typical editorial job. Maybe it's closer to the publishing world. Um, and uh, and so things start to expand because I notice you're doing, uh, you're working for a criterion, you're working for, uh, see things from Netflix, um, all different kind of other areas of the industry are opening up to you now. Um, are you actively chasing that? Um, or is that just people calling you because they like your work? Uh, so far, it's been people calling me because they like my work, which I'm so grateful for because, you know, I wanted to go into VizDev and now people from Netflix, I don't even need to apply for the job. People from Netflix are reaching out to me to do VizDev for them. It's so flattering. But um, yeah, no, I, for the most part, after, like after I had a lot of motivation and drive to get my foot in the door for editorial, but I realized after like a couple of years of working editorial that I don't really know much about how to get into other uh, fields of work. But um, so a lot of the work that has that I expanded outside of editorial has been came to me, which I'm very grateful for. But I am trying to look into publishing more and advertising and kind of expand into like comics and all that kind of stuff. So is that something? Uh, well, again. Uh, throwing yourself off the cliff like that, you probably you probably had to very quickly learn about the editorial market. Who mm -hmm. who were who were the people you were contacting? Who were the <laughs> my 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 dog's about to explode here. He sees something. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get his attention. Please don't. <laughs> um, you, you know, you had to figure out you know, again, and I know you 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 learn this from other professionals, hopefully some at the academy, um, you know, that our industry is run by art directors. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the people, the, the contacts that we need are, you know, who's working for whom and what, what art directors should I be pursuing to get them to hire me? And, um, you know, how you go about doing that. There's, there's different methods that go about, go about doing that, but you had to, when, when you moved to New York, you had to be like a crash course and trying to figure all of that out. Yeah. I started my research, um, before I came to New York because I just had to, cause I couldn't, you know, it, it couldn't possibly make sense if I didn't do the research, but a lot of my education about the field actually came from other illustrators. I had reached out to a couple alumni from my school and also just like random people that I looked up to. I contacted like Patrick Leger. I contacted Liz Feng, Jin Sen, um, lots of different people in just hopes that they would be able to talk to me and give me some insight onto the industry. And they were so kind that they did. They did a portfolio review. They reviewed my work. They gave me tips. They gave me names of art directors. So honestly, I do credit a lot of my education and success to them because they didn't have to help me. I was like a nobody from Florida, but they came out. Yeah, they came out and they were able to meet up with me and just chat with me and really talk to me and name drop so many art directors. It was really, really helpful. And I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that that's... Um... It, another kind of a horrible trait and I'm, I'm not trying to be, be I'm an artist I'm not trying to beat up on artists in general <laughs> I notice these I notice these things from so many people I talk to is that artists tend to want to just be left alone to make their work and they put most of their focus in the and just, as true as anybody they put most of the focus in the things that they really want to do um and and then sometimes there's things we have to do things that we have to make ourselves do um, putting yourself out there, researching, learning about the industry, learning who buys what, what type of function it is, all of that stuff that all play into uh, really the success of somebody getting started. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I know that you went through it. I know that you did it. And I'm, I'm kind of, kind of setting you up here for a little bit is as you, because we just recently had a talk about what you're you know where you want to move to in the industry what else you want to do mm -hmm. um is it's it's kind of 
that type of education, exploring and figuring out what makes that part of the industry work. Um, who are the people that I'm going to be contacting? Who are the people I'm, you know, I, um, my theory is that the emerging artist and you're well, be, I mean, you're well, well beyond that, but trying to emerge in a different part of the industry is you have to, um, you have to kind of make yourself known or memorable to the people you want to work for. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's like getting on their radar. The first, the first thing is figuring out who, whose radar do I need to be on? Um, so are you kind of going through that? Are you thinking about those things right now? I am. I am definitely a lot of my desires and motivations right now are pointed towards like comics right now. So I definitely want to get into publishing and sort of uh, just build that repertoire and be able to get into that field. Uh, so a lot. So it's very similar to what I'm doing, what I did with editorial. It's just a lot of researching, lots of emailing. And just lots of trying to find a wedge my way into an art director's radar. You know, a lot of it is just, you know, being on Twitter and being social and just, you know, fall, creepily well, following art directors and trying to like message. A lot of that is just awareness of, of the artists that are working in that part of the industry. You know, who are they working for? But what is, you know, why are they the ones that are being hired to do this? What is it about their work? What makes it functional? for that part of the industry. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I, I, I just don't think that, I don't think artists do a great job of assessing what their outcomes need to be. And, um, you know, it's part of what we do educationally is trying to work, help people organize that. You know, here's here's a, you know, I'm not gonna, okay, we'll brag a little bit about our program. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good. And it, 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 it really helps people, it's, it's the it's the one thing that I've seen, and I've looked at a lot of educational things, products that helps you define a path, that helps you. Okay, you gotta, you know, you gotta you gotta address all these different things, and then you gotta put it together, uh, a functional piece of work, a body of work, a portfolio that's usable for somebody. But the biggest catch is it all it all has to feel like it comes from the same artist, meaning that there's a personal quality to it. Your work does that so unbelievably well. I don't think there's anybody that you know that follows that would follow follow your work that wouldn't recognize a new piece that you've done. They don't have to look up your name; they know you did it, and that is the ultimate goal. I think um, it makes it so much easier than an art director's like, oh, I have this project that I think Catherine Lamb would be perfect for because your work has a voice to it and you know we all strive to get to there and for somehow you got there really quickly <laughs> um not not sure how you did it <laughs> i don't know really either <laughs> <laughs> well um i have a couple other i have some personal thing personal questions that i wrote down um you work digitally primarily as an illustrator yes um it how much under, I, I, I know the answers to these questions, but I, I want the audience to know. Your understanding of picture making, most of it came from traditional path. Uh, actually, it actually came all the way from digital path. I started like, tr if I, discounting the Sunday basement classes, um, those are traditional. But, no, I'm gonna, no, no, no. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase that. Okay. Yeah. Your, your understanding of picture making, I'm going to, because I don't want to look really silly of being that wrong of what I just said. <laughs> oh, no. no, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase that a little okay. bit. And say, okay. Well, Joaquin Soroya was a traditional painter. Mm. The, the picture making practices, a lot of the artists that you were looking at were traditional artists and, and you applied that information to digital. Um, mm. I don't know. I don't. I don't. And I, I guess it, maybe it matters or doesn't matter. How, however much digital or traditional work that you've done, but you seem to have an understanding of picture making with an unbiased quality of what the medium is. It doesn't matter if it's digital or traditional. Mm -hmm. um, 
talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, how, yeah. Well, the better question is, how did you do that? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just like a lot of studying other people's work. Because I feel like, you know, as an artist, you have to look at other people's work. And what, and I, I don't know why I had a momentary uh, while of time where I just dedicated myself to the old masters and like impressionists and people before that. Oh, it was George, it was George Pratt. That's why. But um, yeah, because of like, thanks to him, a lot of the other teachers at Ringling, I was able to like immerse myself in a lot of just like really incredible work that, um, you know, had so, has so many different qualities to it. But I feel like in regards to how I am able to, you know, transfer this sort of knowledge to both traditional and digital, um, I just, I've always learned digital. A lot of my beginnings started digitally. I didn't do you look at it as all the same? Like Yeah, I, I do look at it as all the same. I don't see it as two different things. I just see that there is an image that needs to be made and we have these tools that can make it. So right. I just yeah, it doesn't matter if it's 3D or whatever, I or a photography even. It's just, you know, you there is an image, it's 2D, and you can control certain elements on the page. How do you control these elements? No matter whether it's pencil, whether it's paint or whether it's digital like how do you just control these shapes and elements to make a cool image well i have i'm going to remind you i have pictures of you with pastels in your hand drawing oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i know that you I, I know that you you know you dealt with traditional materials at some some point um i've, I've seen sketchbook work I've seen all that kind of stuff but um, um and it's it's very different it's like I remember a conversation with John Foster because I, I I relied on John a lot about understanding how digital artists developed and at the time especially for somebody like John he was a traditional artist for a long time before he was a digital artist everything came through the path of learning everything traditionally and then applying it uh, digitally. And so I asked them the question, I said, one day I said, is there, do you know anybody that never did any traditional work at all that, that works at a very high level? And he said, not until recently. Hmm. And he pointed out a couple of people that I can't even remember who he told me at the time, but, but he pointed out a couple of artists that he thought were really phenomenal. And he knows they never did anything. Everything was digital. And so it can be done, but it has to be, but you, you have taken so much from traditional artists. I mean, you, you've, you've learned from them and mm -hmm. you've learned to apply what makes it work. Um, you know, it's like, I, I don't see, you know, study a piece like this. I could say, yeah, I could tell it, you know, there's things that have a digital quality to it in places. Um, but I could see it being done traditionally too. Um, it's just great picture making. And, you know, so I, that's why I said, I'm, I'm pretty unbiased about, you know, what, what people use for material, you know, it, it's an outcome that we're looking for. Um, yeah. So, so to be, I, I do want to admit, I dedicated an entire year after I went to the illustration Academy, I was so in awe at how every, how, well everybody painted that I spent an entire year just watercoloring <laughs> yeah so you you liar <laughs> I know I'm sorry I, <laughs> I forgot a whole chunk of year for my life well no you but but when you were at the academy I mean I, I saw you do things um with traditional materials um okay so um so now you have this uh, this notoriety as a as, and I and I'm going to say this: you're a well-known editorial illustrator. That you know you can pick up. You can go to a newsstand, uh, kiosk, 
And it would not be that uncommon that I could find a Catherine Lamb illustration if I search hard enough. Um, and I think that's really cool and, and congratulations for doing it so quickly. Thank so you. your move, where's your next move? My next move is, I wanna be honest, a little unclear. I've been in like a bit of a limbo for the past year or so, but um, I am looking into getting an agent going into advertising, getting, just getting paid more. That's really <laughs> my biggest concern. <laughs> that's usually, that's usually the, the, the reason why people move from the editorial world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I realized that I could spend, you know, like a week working on editorial, getting paid like 300, 500, or I could spend like a month working for advertising and get paid like 20, 30 times of that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, there, there, again, there's, um, I I think the 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 most interesting, and it's been this way since I mean since I was working as an illustrator, is that you create a uh, kind of a combination of things. You know, you see, you you know, you use Victo as an example. You know, Victo does a lot. She does institutional work. She does advertising work. She does labels. She does all kinds of things, and she does editorial work also. Um, it, it's it's just a really great mixture that that I that I think that it's achievable, but you gotta you gotta really pay attention and you really have to approach and and, and make work that's functional for you know you can't show um, you know a piece that's a that that's a you know a love story or a, a piece that's designed uh, for you know a fantasy book cover and expect to get work doing a wine lake. Um, you have to, well, may, maybe there's a stretch, maybe some of the new labels you could, but, the, but there's, um, there's a function to things that you really have to consider and, you know, to, sh to, to expect to get work, you have to show the appropriate work. Uh -huh. and, and that, that's the reason I ask. It's like, are you, are you really considering those things? I, I know you are. Um, if, if your work is, you know, your work is is doing that i if i'm if i click through foot quicker you're you're gonna we're gonna see things that are different parts of the industry um so i guess the question is how are you how are you purposely identifying that are you doing any personal pieces directed at it or are you just organizing things that you've done that that fit yeah i've been doing a lot more research on like publishers and Sorry. Uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of research on just like publishers and publishing companies and trying to like create work where I can, um, especially for publishing companies, they want to see work already made, especially if you want to like publish a book. You want They want to see work already made and like pitch, you in, pitch them an idea before they can continue on with the with the idea and like publish it into an actual book. So I am thinking of like comic ideas and trying to like draft up like a couple of pages and a story just so I can pitch it to them. So you're you're actually like doing portfolio pieces, pieces, personal work that you can use that's going to take you into that other market. Yeah, basically. Very, very cool. And that's, that's and I, I, I love that. I love that because that's really the only way it works. You know, once you figure it out, you realize, oh, for me to get that, I have to have, I have to have that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> That's something I actually came across a lot when I was promoting myself is that my work, you know, for the most part is on the darker side. It's a lot more moodier and a lot more heavy. And I when in the beginning. I mindlessly and just threw my portfolio at every single person who would just take it you know, like par parenting magazines, children's magazines, um, <laughs> like swimsuit magazines, doesn't matter. And yeah. a lot of them came back to me. It was like, your work is great, but it's just not what we're looking for. And that's how I learned it. It was like, right. you need to give some, you need to know what they are and what they want before you can even be considered for the position. <laughs> A talk I did with the uh, the well-known art director, Lauren Penapento, um, this, these, this, this is paraphrased, but um, she said, "I am the 
creative director, the art director of a fantasy publishing business. And I'm looking for cover artists that do fantasy work. If you want to work for me, that's what you need to show me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't show me. I don't, I don't want to see a greeting card. I don't want to see a, a, a piece of advertising. I want to see fantasy cover work. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Because and it, it's and it's so it, it's so sensible and it's, it makes so much sense that um, you know art directors they're busy they they got lots of things to do um, they they you know they they have timelines they have uh, design work to do whatever whatever makes up their day um, searching for new artists is part of it and you want to make it as easy as possible for them you know. One, just in the physical aspect of how they can see your work, but two, in the functional aspect, show them what they're looking for. Show them things that they're going to recognize. You know, nobody, I, 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 I've, I've said this a lot. It's very difficult assessing illustration if you don't know what it was made for. Um, mm-hmm. You can't tell if it's a good solution or not. Um, I have a question from the audience here. Uh, when you developed a voice so quickly, does it make it? more difficult to try different styles if you if you want if you wanted to when everyone's expecting something so specific of you i think that you know it's important to de- how should i say this voice is different from style ah, in my opinion i yeah. love saying that that's that's it's so true yeah style is very much like oh is this like did you draw like is it line dominant is it shape dominant is it yada yada yeah. and every yeah everybody visual, can visual languages yeah yeah exactly it's just like how you how you assemble your elements on the page together in in a way but um i feel like voice has to do with yourself you know it's not so much how you draw more so what you believe in what you truly like like what your viewpoints are what you like what you like, what you dislike, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, what you think is right, what you think is wrong. I feel like when it comes to voice, like no matter what style you approach it with, it should still be very clear that this is something that you did. So even if you are to experiment and try a lot of different styles, you know, like collage and all this stuff, at the end of the day, there should be, I feel like there's also always something overarching that kind of encompasses everything and collectivizes it into like one portfolio um where, where do you think that comes from where i you, think sorry go ahead no i was just because where do you think what's what's the generator of voice what's the I, thing that, i think it's just like living your life and being a person if that makes sense like being a full person before your career because you could dedicate your whole life to just drawing and making sure that like you know, you can render the hell out of something or make something look really realistic. But it's like, I feel like life experiences really channels into voice because it's like through your life experiences, only will you be able to know what you truly believe in, what you think is important, what you like, what you dislike, what, you know, what you don't think should be shown or what, you know, all these things that kind of like will slowly determine what you decide to depict your concept what how you depict it what you say I think like having a full not even a full life you don't even need a full life you can have like half a life and still like pull a lot of experience from it you know well yeah you were uh, in, uh, incredibly young um to to have such a, a direction and such a voice um but I'm gonna point out you you figured that out early and i and i think that i i 100 agree with you i love your description about the difference between uh style and and surface uh compared to a true voice um your voice comes from a life experiences um and it and again it, you don't have to be the most well-read person in the world or traveled the world it could be uh, you might have a voice based wrapped around pop culture and music that you like that you it could come from bit, something very focused but the trick is the hard part is how do you make that your voice and how do you, uh, you, you as an artist 
having those experiences, how do you how do you access them? And again, I for the nine millionth time I've showed that little video of you doing <laughs> that I always ask you, can I use that <laughs> of, of, of showing process uh, starting with language and it's it's remarkable how how well you move through that, how quickly you move through that and um, I, I just absolutely love that. Um, and it it's you're drawing from memory. You're drawing and you're 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 using text to help you get there to help produce these ideas. And what you're what you're actually doing when you draw from memory, you don't have anything else to um, uh, to be influenced by. You don't have a piece of photo reference. You don't have a a, a, a painting or a piece of photography, anything in front of you. Um, you have to use what you know. And so you've learned to you you have learned to use yourself as a library, and um, that's a really hard trick. Uh, but it's it's but it's but it, it but it's really important and in, in developing voice as an artist. Now I I, I uh, jokingly use my dad's line all the time. He said, "If you practice drawing from memory long enough, you'll eventually start showing up in your own pictures." <laughs> and, and you can see it saying that you know it's like it's really this country smart delivery that he had that was you know he had simplify it and distill it down into something that was so tangible and 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 when he said that the first time I was like well the first reaction was like hey, hey dad you maybe you should have told me that like 10 years earlier <laughs> it would have been very it would have been very helpful to me but I really got it, it, it he the first time I heard it was him talking to students at the academy and um and it just it just twisted me in a major way. It was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm not doing that enough. Um, I I I need to be focusing on how do I get to my experiences, mm -hmm. and that, and and I guess that's it, you know I think that's the the best lesson of anybody that's really trying to 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 you know live your life, but more importantly, know how to access it and use it. And that that little demo that you do that that that, that I share all the time, it's just amazing <laughs> how easily you go there. Um, and it's 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 like um, you know it's like breathing for you. And I'm, and I I, I I I love it absolutely love it. Um, let me think of some of the, 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 I had some other things written down here. Oh, that, that this is a good time to bring that up um, to bring this up. Uh, what's what's it been like for you teaching? Oh, it's been great. I actually really enjoy it. You know, I thought of teaching is so similar to drawing, but yet so different because you're basically explaining your what you're doing. But I can say, at least from my experience, that before I started teaching, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I just kind of had a clue. I was just like, okay, if I put this over here and I put that over there, it'll make sense. You know, it just kind of came naturally to me. So teaching has been like trying to articulate my thoughts, trying to articulate my process and really trying to ask myself, why am I doing this has been in itself like a learning experience for me. So like and just like being able to see other people's work and having to tell myself, all right, like, how do I take something that isn't even my work, break it down and try to boil it down into its most simple elements and try to improve on it that in itself has been a huge exercise on and just been tremendously helping me in the long run just like understanding why things work better and why things kind of flow together so it's been like it's been good I just didn't think that it would help me as much help me like on the professor side as much mm -hmm. as it did I'm really happy to hear that because I love you teaching with us. But, <laughs> um, but you're very good at it. And um, I think that I've heard uh, te teaching's not right. It, 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 again, it needs to be right for somebody in the right part of their career. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to come together to really make it work. Um, the, But um, it does it's like a reflection on, on how it certainly has been for me. 
on how I make my own pictures or how I, it's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm not really doing it. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that's, that's happened to me a lot. Um, very, very funny. Uh, were, you, were you, was Sienkiewicz at the Academy when, when you? Yeah, he was. So I, that might've been his first year. It might, maybe 2015. I can't remember, but I think it might've been his first year. And he came in and he, we, we're, we're kind of walking around the room a little bit. But he, he sees for the very first time he saw our process document that we use, mm -hmm. the one you use in your class. Um, yeah. And discuss and talk about he the simplified version, just the one pager. And he looked at it and he goes, "Oh my god!" He goes, "I need to pin that to my drawing board." He says, "He goes, I get it." He goes, "I should do this every single time I make a picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to be doing." And, uh, uh, not much long after he finished, we finished up. He went home. He sent me a photograph. He goes, "I got it pinned to my drawing board, John." <laughs> You know, funny story, I like to kind of draw my free time. And usually I follow the ideas of like, I, um, I thumbnail and I ID, I ID in and I thumbnail and I do a value study and find reference. And every so often I'm too lazy to follow it. So I'll just like go and do something on my own. And then I'll find myself stuck because I didn't follow the process. And I realized that this whole time I should have, and it's a lesson learned. <laughs> oh man. Um, most of, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of our, our answers in study hall, which is like a, a mid week meetup for our mentorship program, where a group of instructors come together and we deal with it. I, I, I in fact, I, um, I described it the other night as triage for artists or for illustrators <laughs> we have to go in and fix things and try to help people make you know their help them with their projects mm -hmm. and so um in there i think most of the answers were like uh well where's your value study and yeah and, and so the student will say well i didn't really do it well that's your problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because you didn't solve it, it, it like you should have you know the idea of having process is there to to make you better and consistent and get every step right before you go to the next step it's also this is a really process driven industry it, it, no but don't don't have a fantasy of going into as it be becoming an illustrator and saying, well, I'm going to get an assignment and I'm going to do the finish and send it to him. You, yeah. It's the act <laughs> of making a picture with an art director, you know, it, it, and, and I, and I love looking through, like I love going and picking up a, a society of illustrators or a spectrum or American illustration. And I look at it and it's like, most of these illustrations, 99% of them, except for maybe some of the self-published stuff, I said most of these were somebody else's ideas that an illustrator was hired to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not something the illustrator did, like got up in the morning and said, well, I'm going to do this. It was an assignment. Mm -hmm. And so they had to make it. They had to buy into the idea. They had to come up with the idea, come up with the solution and do something very creative was something that they didn't they weren't even thinking about 24 hours earlier <laughs> yeah well that's a really funny way of putting it <laughs> and that, that makes those books even better for me and it could because it makes you know again i um we we were i was watching uh jaw cooper as one of our guest speakers a week or two ago a week ago whatever whenever it was and i and it's a magnificent drawer and um and I, I said to her, I said, that watching her, it's like watching magic. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's the closest thing to magic that I, I know is watching really creative people make visuals. Um, you can see them think, uh, it, it, the creativity aspect of it. It's just, it's, it's so beautiful when, when it, when, when people are really good at it. And, and I think that about you know, all the, all the work that's produced, not, I mean, not all of it, I'm not in love with all of it, but there's so much high quality work that's produced every year. And it's a group of artists making images, solving problems with somebody else's, you know, with, with somebody else's idea and somebody else's, else's problems. And they're just supplying this, the visual solution. 
and that makes it even better for me uh, because it's it's just harder to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think good artists imagine imagine uh, giving somebody like Gary Kelly or Sterling Hunley free reign and just say, just make all the beautiful pictures you want to make and enter them in the Society of Illustrators. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Without the limitations of the assignments, uh, they would win even more gold medals, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like. Um, you know, part of part of all that being a problem solver, um, it, it, is that something, is that journey and chase something you really enjoy? I do. I'm going to be honest, not much of a, I love the thumbnailing process. I think that's the fun, most fun part because it's where you just like get to throw around ideas and make a new cool image. Um, after that, it actually becomes a bit of a bore for me. <laughs> Um, once I get past the thumbnail, once I get past like making a cool composition, once I have to find reference and once I have to start rendering is actually when I start snoring. <laughs> and yeah, I'll like take days, to fin- days, even months to finish something just because I don't want to like, I was like, I got the idea. I got the composition, the gist of it. What more do you want from me? <laughs> and I, I, yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's so great. Uh, because do you feel like you've solved the problem at the thumbnail stage? Yeah, I feel like I was like, I did it. <laughs> I came up okay. with the idea that I need. And then I think that I just want to get rid of it afterwards. Okay. Like I um you you had the I, I know you had the opportunity of going to my dad's studio and you probably saw thumbnails laying all over the place. Oh yeah. It was it um going to your dad's studio was so fun. Only because I at the time, at that age, I didn't I couldn't fathom having your own studio, but also just being able to see like how just the way he works, he was like, at least from from what I remember, it was like a controlled chaos. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it it changed. I mean, he, he was all, he was, he was like a, a scientist. I mean, he was always experimenting and, and, and I, well, I was going to make I, where I wanted to go with this about going into his studio and seeing all those thumbnails. I have stacks of them now. I mean, just, I mean, thousands of them. And there's just brilliant picture making in them. And it's like, I, I almost like, I look at it and like, I can't look at these too long because if I were to take anything from him, I could take these designs <laughs> and make all these great pictures or try to anyway. He's already <laughs> solved all these design issues, design problems. And, and I just think it's the most valuable. I mean, I have a lot of artwork of his that has a much more higher monetary value to it. But as an artist, it's probably the most valuable thing of his that exists um, because he was so he was it was such a big part of what he did and it made it's what made him him you know to 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 be able to design all these things out of his head and that's where the basic structure of the picture lived Mm -hmm. um and 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 there's just an immense number of them um i i I look through them frequently and and i'm always like "Eh, i can't touch that that's not right (laughs) it's not me either so I know I I know better but you know but somebody could probably reproduce those things uh or go and start making pictures with his uh the basic understanding I mean with just the the light and dark patterns that he's put into these little squares as thumbnails Mm -hmm. um anyway I'm so I it's that that makes sense to me that you 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 would say that because because you do it so well oh thank you Uh, um yeah. this piece I did for I did this piece like overnight I'm pretty sure it was like a one-day assignment who was it for it was for the New Yorker wow yeah and from this piece I was contacted by the director of the show to do a get a print from them so that was really cool and also one of my I, I was I'm not actually allowed to sell this piece but I sell it anyway I don't care for contracts you should care for contracts, but don't do what that I do. Is, is it the New Yorker you said? Yes, it is the New Yorker. Okay, well, so that's really interesting to me that um, why editorial can be so effective because so many people look at it, mm-hmm. and, and and it can open up so many doors. 
um, that's so cool that that uh, you know uh, I'm trying to was it the, the Last of Us? Did you do? Yeah, it? it was. Yeah. Okay. So I was pulling images to do a drawing or to for our open drawing night on Thursday night, and I was going through the Last of Us, and oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow, what, what a great connection. There's one of our instructors doing it. <laughs> uh, that, that's so cool. Uh, that's so cool. That's the, and, and, and I think that's, yeah, it's one of the things I love about the editorial world. Um, I don't know any of these you want to stop on and talk about, feel free to. Um, I, I could just sit and look at them all night. Um, Okay, I, I got some more things written down here I want to get to. Um, okay, so teaching. Uh, next thing is what, like currently, have have the your influences and your artists changed a lot in the last five or six years? Yeah, I used to love and look up to a lot of illustrators. I, could, I used to be able to list like every illustrator that was popping up at, that were, like was in every single annual or whatever. I recently though I've drifted away from that and I've been looking a lot of conceptual artists like um Felix uh Felix Gonzalez Torres I've been looking a lot of like Tracy Emin a lot of like Lu Louis uh, what's her name Louise Borgio Bourgeois I, I can't pronounce her name <laughs> but just a lot of like conceptual artists and modern artists only because I just want to be more closely connected to that world. Not my career, just I want to be more familiar with that world. I feel like they have a lot of cool ideas and they're constantly pushing the boundary of what it means to what it means to be an artist and what it means to make art. That I feel like we should be checking in on them more often than we are. <laughs> Well, that, that that my question worked perfectly. Well, for, first of all, I have to explain. I was giggling there. Um, don't expect me to step in and pronounce that name properly. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst at it. So, uh, <laughs> so um, my question though, you've you've gone exactly where I was hoping that you would. Uh, so you're talking about like current influences. You live in New York. Do mm -hmm. you take advantage of the city? Do you do you go to gallery openings? Do you go to museums? I do actually. I do I do go to a lot of gallery openings. Not as I used to go to a lot of like museums and exhibitions in like very high end galleries like uh is it white box or I'm I'm not sure. I don't know. Um but just a lot of the Chelsea galleries that are very um high end. But recently I've been looking more into like the more local stuff. So like art shows, art fairs, tattoo fairs, that kind of stuff. And just, I feel like checking out what's around your city, even if it's not like, especially if you live in a place like New York City, you have like a lot of opportunity to look at like the high end stuff. But I also feel like you should look at the like the lower end stuff too. Just like broaden your horizons and really look around and experience all the art that you can. Um, there's There's so much there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unbelievable. The um, uh, when I when I was getting started, well, first when I I grew up just outside of the city, and in in a rural town in Connecticut, and a lot of illustrators live there. And one of the things that I I saw uh, some some of my favorite illustrators, my dad included, is they literally planned like okay friday this is what we're doing we're going into the city and we're going to hit all the galleries and we're going to go see this particular show taking advantage of of the art world that i mean it's like a hub of one of the major hubs of international art world mm -hmm. and being able to take advantage of it but now when i was getting started um and i was travel i was going into the city a lot and a lot of and, and i did not live there but a, a lot of and a lot of my peers and friends that I that I knew that were developing lived in the city and they were so they were so caught up in the illustration world or they were so broke they were working second jobs or they were doing something 
with their time and not being able to take advantage of the city. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, that's such a shame. You know, it's like, I, you know, for years up into, well, the last time I, I spent uh, a, enough time to go and go, go look at galleries, go to museums, which was with Sterling in 2020, um, be right before COVID. And since COVID, I have not been back. Uh, well, I, I take that back. I've been back once uh, with, with, with my son and my wife. Um, I could only, they, their limitations on how many galleries I could go to was short. <laughs> um, um, we went to the Natural History Museum. We all had common <laughs> ground there. And uh, my son was like, do I have to look at any more paintings? Um, <laughs> you know, when we were at MoMA or whatever, it's like, can we do something else? Um, so that was, um, I, I, and I, I think it's, I think it's an obligation as an artist to not just look at what you do, look at what everybody else does and try to know about it. Um, yeah, and, I agree with that. I think it's are, an obligation as an artist to just try to learn everything you can. Yeah, you, you are in the, the, it, as far as our country goes, you are in Mecca for that. And, oh Yeah. And and I'm glad you're taking advantage of it. Um, and and it's a lesson to everybody. It's like, and there's so many, like even here in Kansas City. Kansas City's got a wonderful art community. It's got a you know, it's got a great museum or a couple of good museums. Um, one really great museum. And um, well, I, they have also a really great contemporary museum, also. Um, but uh, yeah, take take the time to to look at. To look at things that uh, you know influences are very very important. Um, let me keep speak up about. Is this a spot or was this a full? So page? this was actually a spot. This illustration, I didn't think it would turn out at all. I thought it was going to be one of the ones that I hide in my folder forever and never have to show. But it actually turned out kind of nice. It's very yeah. nice, and, and there and, and um, spot illustrations that are you know usually are connected to maybe another illustration, or they they carry a small amount on the page, so they usually don't pay that much. But they're no. really hard to do. They uh, are <laughs> uh, uh, a vignette, something that bleeds to white. It's it's all about the. Co- I mean, composition. It's like it 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 really wrenches or or. or or uh, ratchet up the the design skills that you need to make something interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, it's it's a great piece and uh, tough to do. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Is it, did did you have did you have when you got this piece? Did you have spots in your portfolio, or was this one of the was so- this yeah, that's actually interesting that you asked that. I had I have besides this one, no spots in my portfolio. I think though, like I don't know if people hi like hire people specifically to do spots. I'm sure they do. But I also know that spots accompany a lot of full illustrations sometimes. So it is something that um a lot of illustrators just sort of have to do. And it is something I struggle with, but it's a lot of fun. Well, I could see you getting a lot of spots, <laughs> spots <laughs> from this going forward. They're they're tough to do, um, and you know it's again it's uh, very valuable. Uh, it's it's something that can be very valuable to an illustrator to have in their portfolio to have something functional. Um, you know, it's like on the on the concept side. Um, people that are doing game design that are do, that are in character design and you think about like a major tabletop game you know there might be I don't know 10 12 15 characters in it maybe much less but in a game like that in a major major game there might be hundreds of icons mm-hmm. you know just designing simple icons um, this is, relates to that very much. Uh, it's they they almost have a they have to have a kind of a graphic quality to read, um, and not everybody can do them. And the ones that can, the people that can do them um, get get hired a lot to do them. So um, something to always think about. Mm-hmm. How about this one? 
Ooh, this one was one of my first assignments I ever done. It was super fun. And well, it wasn't, I mean, the article wasn't fun. The article was about um, this woman who like revisits her dying mother's closet only because uh, she felt like wearing her clothes was one way to get closer to her mother. So it was a really sad article. And, but it was extremely, it was, this one I learned a lot from because in the beginning when I was starting my editorial career, I thought that only concept, big concept was allowed, like high concept and sort of, you know, really, really complicated metaphors and very complex ideas. And when I saw that they had chosen this particular thumbnail, I realized that I think this was the piece that made me realize that, oh, I can just make mood in a concept as well. I don't have to force myself to do things that I'm not capable of doing. That's, that's, that's interesting. Um, that as a, doing concept in my career, it was always mood. It was the only concept I had. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I, I came at a kind of a funny time as an illustrator that, you know, it was before digital. Um, it was kind of the end of the the magazine world as far as like uh, women's magazines where there was a lot of uh, uh, boy, girl story, love story, that type of thing. Um, and the, the type of work I got um, or the type of work that was becoming really popular uh, was conceptual work. And it was mm -hmm. less, less narrative. And it took me a while to figure out, wow, I could do this if I can just keep my narrative, my, my concept to move. And it, it was became more of how I painted something or or, or the mood I established in the piece. Um, and uh, it works well. Um, it, it, it's 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 it, it worked for me. And um, you, you're you're the mood that you're delivering in your work is amazing. Thank you. How about this one? This one was a piece that they they had asked me to do a piece about COVID in prisons. COVID was a very lucrative time for me, unfortunately. But um, yeah, no, they had asked me to do a piece about uh prison, like life in prison during COVID. And this one, I well, in regards to the lighting, I actually thought that this was the correct lighting. <laughs> I thought that there, there was nothing wrong with it until I started working on the piece. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I think doesn't make any sense. But um, yeah, no, this piece um, was very, it was very different because I had to depict, first of all, a top, like a bird's eye view, but also like four different scenes within one and also to have to get everything accurate. Who, and it was- I, I didn't, maybe I didn't catch it. Who was the client? Uh, this was for the New York Times Magazine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. they, the proportions of it was, was it a quarter page or was it? Uh, it was like a full page, but not, it was like a three fourths page okay. spread. Yeah. But um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I just remember... What, what did I remember about this? I made a lot of changes to this. That's all I remember. It was just the amount of edits that I had to do. And it, I, I assume New York Times, it was probably a pretty quick turnaround. Yeah, this was about two or three days. So how many changes can you do? <laughs> how many changes do they ask you to do in two or three days? They asked for about, not that much. Actually. They only asked for four, but four, I usually get no changes or like one small change. So four was already like too much in my book. And I was like, starting to be like, all right, you got to start paying me like a, like a revision fee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, that might, that might start happening earlier. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Move. Yeah. This one was also a very sad piece about a woman who whose mom was dying and her mom requested to um, die via assisted suicide and she couldn't go through with the decision. So her died, her mom died of natural causes. And yeah, this was very, like very beginning of my career. I was trying to do something very metaphorical, very abstract, 
but a lot of the a lot of the art directors were like, we hired you because you're good at depicting a mood. You're good at depicting the feeling of death. And that's what we want. We just want that. We don't want you to, you know, we don't want you to do things that you're not comfortable with. We want you to do things that you like to do, which unfortunately for me is this. <laughs> um, okay, so that, that brings up a number of questions for me. So typically when an art director hires you, do they point you to like pieces that are the reason why they hire you? Like, hey, I, I really love this piece. Is this, I'm looking for something. This is the reason I hired you is because these images here. Um, uh, yes and no. For shorter turnarounds and smaller jobs like the New York Times, they don't ask. They just ask if I'm interested in the article. Um, for more established magazines, where they are coming to me because they want something very specific. They usually like will have an image like in the folder and be like, we were looking for something like this. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's interesting. So um, do you like when they, when they give you like a suggestion, like, Hey, I saw these pieces. Does it, it, it kind of give you an idea of where you, you, you should go with it or do you think that it limits you? I, usually totally forget that they want me a certain thing and it completely <laughs> just just completely just falls out of my mind but um yeah no I um I like it when they post like my new work and they're like oh I saw your new work I really like that your new experimental stuff let's just go with that I love it when they ask me that I hate it when they like <laughs> pull things from five years ago and they're like do something like this and I'm like Ugh. It's been a while. I don't want to do that. That's great. Yeah. Ooh, this piece. Also, oh, do for both of those. This piece was sort of New York Times as well. Also a very sad piece. I don't really remember what the article was about. That's funny. I'm thinking about you talking about it, pointing you to in a direction of a piece. Um, my dad worked for so long in the industry towards the when he was I guess he was not illustrating anymore at that time he was just focusing on painting and an art director came to him with uh some book work that was done like during the 60s and this was like around 2000 oh gosh <laughs> so he he called me and he was giggling he was saying I gotta tell you just what happened to me and I said what's that and he said well this art director contacted me and um and I told him, I said, this, this is not, I don't do this anymore. This is so far removed. And then he starts looking at the images. And he goes, and I didn't even do it. He goes, this is somebody else's work. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so the, the art director had the, had the nerve. He said it was, he goes, he just said, well, do you know who did it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was because he wanted to be able to co contact him. I thought, oh my God, that's no yeah. shit. Um, that's funny. This is connected to that. Is this the same? Oh, no. But this is also COVID. Oh, okay. another COVID piece. I love that RX sign in there. So, oh, so, yeah. So readable. Yeah. This is a good example of like why I feel like it's so important to go outside and live a life because this was. This is if you go on Google Maps or if you just come to Brooklyn, this is exact. This is right outside my apartment. So, yeah. And I, like they specifically wanted a scene in New York about COVID. And I feel like if I had <laughs> just been a shut in in my room, I would have never seen this. I mean, this is like a very common scene, but still, it's just like it, inspiration from all so aspects of life. Tell me your process on this. So, so when you got the assignment, did you go out looking around and shoot some photos? You know, I could have done that because I could have just walked outside. I did, uh, but I kind of pulled mostly from memory and anything that I needed specific, like the structure of the the the, the subway thing. I used like Google Maps for it, but for the most part, most of this was from memory. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. Oh, thank you. I, I love how you handled the, you know, obviously the loneliness, the, the isolation of the figure and scale, all of that. So, so great. Thank you. 
article about tech of some sort? There's the... Yeah, this is about sexism in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. Gets it gets you there really quick. Another COVID piece. I love this piece. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm. I love the fact the liberties that you've taken in it, um, just for the design sense. Um, it's beautifully composed, and you know, a technician might look at it and say, "Well, your light source is all over the place," <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It, those shadows work. Uh, they they they're doing their job, but they but they also are supporting the. You know, their shapes in a picture, and that's the most important thing. Um, exactly. They, 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 uh, they, it's for the betterment of the picture. Let's put it that way. Yeah. A lot of students come up to me and ask, is the perspective correct in this image? <laughs> is the, per does the perspective look right? And I'm like, I don't, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck if your perspective looks right. <laughs> well, it, the, the answer, the answer you should give is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, pers perspective. I, I I read this somewhere. I I think I have it in our perspective in, in a document about perspective somewhere. It's probably probably in your class. And if you read through the whole thing, somewhere it says mature artists um, don't necessarily hold their pick. You know, how I'm paraphrasing here. Don't necessarily follow direct perspective. It doesn't have to be that accurate. It just has to be believable, mm -hmm. and and I truly believe that's true. And I, and you know somebody like um, and I think somebody you know Gary, perfect example. Gary Kelly, he uses overlap as his per perspective all the time. There's all kinds of different tools besides gritting your piece um, and getting things right. You just it just has to feel right. And again, if we were designing something that had to be built, yeah, it's probably going to have to be accurate. <laughs> yeah. in, in, in our world, it doesn't. It just has to be interesting and has to do its job. Yeah, that actually, um, I held that belief for so long that it actually got me in trouble when I did VizDev because I was so adamant to not use perspective that <laughs> they were they were like, like this, like I don't know what industry you were in that didn't need to use perspective, but this is this stuff. You better use it now. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. Uh this was like I would love to do more articles or more images like this, sort of like abstract and very like like not figure based because this was really fun. This was about caves and cave paintings. I would love to do something like this. Did you do a lot of research on it? You look at a lot of cave paintings? Yeah, it was very fun. And like, um, I didn't know, I didn't realize. And it's actually kind of sweet to know that like, no matter how far back in history you go, people still gravitate towards art. And I think, and I think that will be true going forward too. Yeah, I there's agree with that. There's something about visual storytelling that I think it's important. I think it's, you know, it's recording what's going on. It's uh, personal reflection. There's all kinds of things that I, that I think other people react to. And so I always look at, there's a place, there's a place for good picture makers that can tell a story or solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is one of my favorites of yours. Oh yeah. I just love it. Um, this was a, a personal piece that I did when I was feeling really burned out from like doing so much work um, I think personal work is so valuable because it's where you truly get to explore when you know client work you're being hired to do something so you like for I mean you get to for you get a lot of leeway if you have a good art director but for the most part you got to do what your art director wants you know but when it comes to personal work this is truly where you get you shine this is where really truly where you get to do whatever you want you get to say whatever you want draw whatever you want design it however you want nobody's ever going to say anything <laughs> and so I feel like 
it's really valuable and indispensable like to do personal work and really just explore on your own i i couldn't agree more and maybe that's why i love this piece so much because it 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 um you did it without some of those constraints that you might have normally mm -hmm. you got everything right <laughs> beautiful thank you this one too and i i i, um, I love the when i first first saw this i was how you handled whatever those are those lights or those the or what what's floating are they are they like um uh, yeah, they're like lamps. They're, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of them. I I know I um, but the, I I just love how you handle them. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this one, this one was fun. I think all I cared about for this piece was I wanted to, <laughs> as if your parents were scolding you. Yeah. Really. Yeah, I wanted to get the feeling that, like. You walked into the room and your parents are about to give you some really bad news. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I could take this piece and talk about it with students as like just good design principles that have been applied to a pictorial. It's just absolutely phenomenal the way you compose this piece. I love Thank it. You. I love the, the variety of shapes, you know, that that big dominant looming dark shape over their heads. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of emotional content in that, but it's, it's also, you know, there's design rules being used here that, that make it function pictorially. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Oh, this one, this one was from a collection of images about a bunch of crimes that happened in Oregon. Um, you know, I, I will admit that sometimes when I submit a thumbnail and they choose it, I don't agree with my art director. And I'm like, art director, you made a horrible mistake. And <laughs> I, don't th I don't think <laughs> the sketch did, that you chose was the correct one. For, for example, how many did you submit? I, well, um, in this one, they had hired me to do about six illustrations. So mm -hmm. I submitted 12 sketches. And so, you know, they, I only gave them two options. So there was one that I liked and one that I didn't like. And they, for the most part, <laughs> chose the one I didn't like. And, <laughs> and then, like, I feel like, but that's, you know, part of being an illustrator where, like, part of the caveats that comes with it is that sometimes you don't get to do what you want. And yeah. another skill that you, you as an illustrator need to have is to be able to turn a really bad sketch into a really good final. Well, it, it, I mean, that kind of goes, I mean, ideally, don't show an art director anything you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, <but> sometimes <laughs> time constraints and just coming up with great solutions. It's like you, you get... Um, you choose favorites, you know, it's like, I would so much rather make this picture than that picture. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, obviously you, you did a great job with the picture itself, but um, yeah, I, I wish, you know, it's like submit, you know, generally you're submitting two to four images to an art director and, you know, rule of thumb is what everybody says. Don't show them anything you don't want to make because they're going to pick the one you don't want to do. And yeah. it, it does happen. <laughs> Oh, this is part of the collection of the yeah. crimes current in Oregon. What is this? This one was a personal piece that I did. I um killer. Oh, thank you. This one was based. <laughs> this one was based on my uh, one ex an experience I had in the bathroom at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Drawing like nice experiences. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, how how do you how do you go about deciding? is your color all emotionally based i mean how, yeah. do you, how, do you, how do you i mean do you leave that is that something you decide at the end once you design you know you get a black and white thing or you develop color and value at the same time how, how do you handle color uh the way i handle color i handle at the very end i finish 
I usually take like my value study work sketch and I try to finish it as close as I can in black and white before I start applying color. And color is for me is super it's it it should both adhere to your concept if you have one and if you are going for one and it should also I feel like color I feel like if you have a good composition it doesn't really matter what color you use but you should always try to use color in a way that makes it better so you know so you you approach it like in a, in an intuitive fashion you yeah know, just kind of let it happen <laughs> yeah if it just feels right then I'll go with it Mm -hmm. yeah that's uh i most of my favorite colors that's that's how they handle it you know they it, and again there's color it's kind of like the perspective thing mm -hmm. there's the mechanics of color and how it works in it and again and there's lots of books written on how color works and the mechanics of it and uh that can be very boring and not, mm -hmm. that's not exciting color most of the time. So it's like, how can you, how can you make, how can you understand color, be able to use it that where it has impact? And I, and my favorite artists, I think that's the approach they take. And they, and, and it's usually very intuitive. Um, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, some of the, the artists that I knew a lot about that came before me and, I watched how they use color and it was something that they apply. And this was traditional painting, traditional picture making, mm -hmm. traditional materials. Um, they wanted to, that exploration, just exactly like you described it. That was like the last piece of the puzzle. They decide, they, they've solved their division of space. They solved their values and they were going to leave, you know, that was all done in the process work but they love to be able to explore color because again, you could make, you could do this in four or five different palettes and be very effective. Mm -hmm. they might, it might have different moods to it. You may not have the mood that you want, but I think in, intuitive color is always the most exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I think color, I think what your father said about color, uh, that it always, it never saved a painting, but it always it could always ruin one. I think <laughs> that always like I can never forget that phrase because it's like anybody who's dealt with color knows us that is so true. You no, know, Ray Bonilla says it really well too. He says most people, you know, students will come to him and said, I'm having a really bad color problem. And he'll look at it and go, It's not the color, it's the value. <laughs> you got to fix the values first before you can even worry about the color. Yeah, you know, color can work a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. uh, but the values value structure is usually where problems come in. Exactly. This one was the first one I didn't procreate. Do you, I will. Sorry, do you, go ahead. Do you do a lot of your finishes in procreate now? Complete finishes? No, I actually hate procreate. <laughs> I um, <laughs> I find it um. Well, there goes Procreate as a sponsor. Oh, so sorry, guys. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but I, I'm a, I'm a Photoshop baby. I grew up using Photoshop illegally. Downloaded one, but still, <laughs> yeah. Great. I don't know any other program. I know a lot, a lot of people that use Procreate, especially. Uh, it's again, it's something that's easier, maybe easier for somebody to learn at the beginning. Um, uh, it's maybe a little bit more intuitive to like drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I, I see people use it for uh, studies, for sketches and studies, um, but not as many people use it for finishes. And uh, I guess more and more people are, but um, Photoshop still the kind of the industry standard. Yeah. What's the story behind this one? It's beautiful. This one was about uh, sudden divorces in the UK. Um, this one, uh, I don't remember much about this piece other than the fact that it won me a silver at society. <laughs> yeah. And well, it should. Oh, thank you. Oh, this one. Uh, this one, I remember, I don't remember much about it. I just remember having so much trouble 
thinking about where to place those tiny people um because i needed them to i needed to look i mean i needed to make the room look populated but not like busy so it's just a lot of dark silhouettes oh this one um this one i this one is for washington post about this what was it, what was the article called i nobody knows what to say when i tell them i try to commit suicide or something very very heavy topic oh man mm -hmm. well beautiful image mm -hmm. thank you oh the 25 five dollar movie poster <laughs> yeah it was 25 dollars. i did it for a zine and um full i had full reign over what i could do so i did this movie and just really my cat won't shut up but i've just really played with um composition and like mood and color i just wanted to make it feel very desolate that's beautiful um it's so, it's so when you say the $25 movie poster, you did the piece for $25? I did the piece for the zine. And then when they got all the profits back and they like split it up amongst the contributors, I only got $25. <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> Boy, that's, I mean, were you, I mean. Were, were I mean, you, I kind of expected it because it was a zine. Yeah. But yeah, I was just like, man, well, $25. They got, they got their money's worth, I'll say that. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Wonder what the actors got. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to stop sharing. I, we, we, we've gone through all the images. I got a couple more questions to ask you. Yeah. That, and this one, I think we've talked about a little bit, but uh, like right now, currently, who are, who are the artists you're looking at? Who are your artists? Uh, Oh my gosh, Dadu Shin. Um, really? I know. Yeah, Dadu <laughs> Shin. Great. He's great. Uh, have you seen his recent work with Gallery Nucleus? I have not. Uh, it's just, I think it's just blue ballpoint pen on paper. And he does it in like, he just like does like these scribbles and then creates like an image out of it. Oh, it's so beautiful. Do you know but, him? Uh, I don't know him, though I did meet him once. <laughs> And I cracked a joke and he laughed. So that was he, good enough for me. Well, he's very, he's very, he's a very funny individual. Oh, um, is he? I had him as a student um, at the Academy. And the last time I saw him was, I think at the award, awards night 2020 at the Society of Illustrators, I had a brief conversation with him. And I, I would love to get him in here. There's so many people that look at him. Mm -hmm. uh, the really, really good artist. Yeah, he, I think he's my favorite only because he's so experimental. He never stays in one place, like, like, artistically, he's constantly expanding and looking for new things and like, doing experimenting and playing with sh like different types of styles and concepts and everything. It's just like, so inspiring, because I feel like as an artist, that's what I want to, I want to emulate that just ex experimentation and constant exploring well that, that, that's man what good example of that mm -hmm. um it, yeah he's he's terrific mm -hmm. um okay so this is a this is this is maybe a little bit more involved but i know i'm going to look at i'm going to look break this in a couple of couple of parts here uh first one is you've discussed a little bit about moving into other parts of the industry mm -hmm. what what's what does that look like on a timeline for you what do you expect like is that something that you want to happen in the next year 18 months two years and then the second part of that is what do you want to be doing you know later in life uh well the first question i do want to move forward to like advertising and comics um and i plan on doing that at the end of this year I was I have a couple of things I need to wrap up first before I can like fully commit myself to like a new portfolio um in terms of what I want to do later in life I'm not sure I haven't 
thought that far ahead. I just know that I do want to move into gallery at one point and kind of become like a gallery artist and be able to sell my work like directly to client to to individuals instead of like kind of working through a business to get my work out there just selling directly to the client uh, to the customer mm -hmm. okay. is that um so i mean is it, i mean you think because you know, i i know i get I, I keep having this visions of you walking around and going to these gallery openings <laughs> <laughs> and then thinking and then thinking to yourself i can do that <laughs> 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 and, i would love to it's a very seductive thing it i mean is. yeah um i you know i it, you know the first time i sold a few painting paintings in a gallery i was like okay this is this is where i want to go <laughs> uh, and, and and again i i did illustration work for 25 years i i i had plenty of time doing that um and i think i think illustration is a, a wonderful training ground for just picture making in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have so many things thrown at you. There's so many things that you have to, to, to research and learn how to do. You know, it's like, like learning to do that spot illustration. You know, it's like, I can't tell you how many times as an illustrator, someone who said, um, look at my portfolio and said, well, this is what I'm looking for. Can you do this? Hmm. You always say yes. Mm -hmm. But then you go back and you like, I got to learn how to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, and I think that's what, what's so great about the illustration industry, especially what you're doing right now, because it's got so much variety to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so many different, you know, possibilities and, you know, of going to a different part of the interest industry and having even more variety to it. But you probably... You probably have this thing when you go into a gallery, and that's what I always did. As I go and I look at look in the gallery, it's like, I think I can do that. I mean, I, I I'm pretty confident I can do that, mm -hmm. and and I I just I don't know. Um, is that seductive to you? I mean, is that something you might think about? You know, pursuing outside the illustration world. Oh yeah, I definitely when the gallery class popped up, it was so <laughs> enticing. That <laughs> wanted to take it so bad but um no yeah it is definitely something that I, I am interested in I just you know like I feel like and correct me if I'm wrong but gallery work, gallery work seems a lot more self-directed than like editorial for example yeah, well yeah it is but it has its it's had it's, it kind of has its limitations if you mm -hmm. get to a certain point you know it's like I I think the last 15 years of my dad's life he never considered who or what he was making a picture for he was mm -hmm. making it for himself mm -hmm. and he got to a point where he could do that earlier in his you know his illustration world like as you and me and everybody else that works as an illustrator you're solving everybody else's problems but at the beginning of what he did as a painter he you have to start somewhere and you have to have a voice just to, just like you do in the illustration world and a function maybe it's a genre that you choose All right, robert heindel said said to me he said the biggest thing the biggest problem he had of of transferring to become a painter and do work just for himself is i had to figure out what i was going to paint hmm. and i had to figure out what um what genre what kind of emotional content, what it was going to look like. I had to, I had to establish that. And I think that's very true. And I think to become successful as a gallery painter, just like an illustrator, you got to do something long enough that people recognize you for that, mm. you know? Mm. So it's yeah. like, I can identify because the gallery, uh, truth, truth in my fear, my, my theory is like the galleries can be more commercial than the illustration world. You mm. know, th their job is to sell work. Yeah. Again, there's blue chip galleries. There's all kinds of different galleries. I mean, there's galleries that are more about like they're almost museums. You know, maybe the Marble Gallery, something like that. But nobody's going to start off in the Marble Gallery. Um, you know, you you're, you're going to work your way up through this. You know, uh, you know, there's galleries that have more, more, much more notoriety than other galleries. And you, you know, you develop as an artist, but again. I think that 
you have to be you have to be recognizable. You know, you have to do something of the same. It's like I've seen I've seen artists try to make huge shifts as gallery painters and galleries drop them immediately. And it's like mm. we've established selling this type of work with you. And we got to start all over if you're going to do this. Hmm. And I, I know, I know, you know, my dad had some of that happen to him. I've been really fortunate that um, I do pretty much what I want to do, but it's in the confines of like a regional landscape painter. You know, it's like um, it, it, there's an expectation, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I know that like if I'm delivering a painting to a gallery in Colorado, they don't want to see a regional landscape of, you know, of a beach. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of out of place for them. Um, you know, so that there's some sense of, you know, knowing what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I, I, I think that, you know, personal and controlling that, I, I do think you have more control of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and, and the ones that can really control it are the ones that are the most successful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so I have a, I have a couple of questions here from the audience. Okay, I wanted to get to. I have a question about voice. Is there a point where voice takes over too much and you leave the viewers feeling alienated? Hmm. I let me think. You know, yes, there is. I have seen some artists where their opinions maybe are so quote unquote edgy that and there's you know their work is so quote unquote edgy that like people don't like it you know but at the same time there are also people who do and you know one thing about that is that while you're going to garner a lot more people who don't like it you're also going to garner a lot of people who do like it you know and it's just a matter of I think that's the thing with having such a strong a voice so strong that it becomes a bit out there is that at one on one end the mass the, the masses aren't going to appreciate it as much but then you're going to find a lot of people who do appreciate it yeah I yeah and they're and they're going to double down on you um mm -hmm. you know it's like a, um you got again people that do like political work um especially now everything being so partisan it's like you you're like picking a team <laughs> it's it's like um okay this person's known for really beating up on this party um whatever publication that that that, that drives that party is probably not going to be interested in you doing you know work for uh, uh working for the opposite side mm -hmm. um so I, I mean again you you have to think about that stuff but i i, I don't think that i think i think il illustrators can can kind of be they have to take well I, th I think in most cases they have to take their dial back their feelings or their um personal point point on a topic like that you know, it's um, I, I think it's great when illustrators draw the line where it's like I refuse to work for that person because or that individual or that particular venue because I don't I, my beliefs don't align with it. I think I think that's really good and I think it's very appropriate. But there's also like working for mainstream editorials. Um, you kind of have to be a little ambiguous about that. Mm -hmm. um, because you want it, you want to get the work from both sides, and you're you're just a commentator about it. And um, when there's and there's a lot fewer assignments these days that they're looking for the vo the, the the opinion of the illustrator. Um, they usually want the, uh, the 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 they usually give that you know that's part of the assignment. You're you're going to illustrate this point of view. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think generally that, that illustrators should be willing to, to until you get to like personal beliefs and things you just totally disagree with um, where it's harmful or you just it, it just is something you can't you can't do emotionally. 
I, I think that illustrators should be open to it. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I don't I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or not. No, I totally agree with that. I feel like, um, especially with political things, like you are allowed to have your own opinion. And that opinion could mean you can voice that opinion in many different ways, whether it be you take the assignment or not, whether it be you draw what they want or you draw your own thing. I feel like, you know, we often think of, how should I say this? We, our actions mean a lot more than you may think. And the actions that you take uh, add as much to your voice as does your artwork. You know, like, I feel like it's just as important to have your own strong beliefs than to, you know, give it away for another reason. And also, I also, yeah, and I also agree with the whole, like, you know, um, the like mainstream editorial, you often need to have like an unambiguous voice. And that may be a little, you know, challenging sometimes, especially if you have a really strong opinion about something. But I often feel that like there are many ways you can voice and your voice is really strong. And yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I think that's well said. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's a requirement, you know, Ill, Ill, Illustrator is there for, you know, it, it's illustration I means to explain. And mm -hmm. you're explaining whatever the point of view of the article is. Um, and it, again, if you don't, if you don't totally agree with it, or you want to put a huge slant on it, it may not align with that organization very well. It may not align with that, that venue or, or magazine. Um, so you, you know, you got to pull back or decide not to do the job. Mm -hmm. That's just part of it. I have one more really simple question. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, uh, is Photoshop purely a personal choice or are there things it can do to finish a piece that other apps like Procreate can't? So I use Photoshop as a personal choice because I, it's purely a personal choice. I've seen people finish work and procreate i think people like i mean like look at all the people who do the work traditionally you know <laughs> um, you know yeah it's just purely a personal choice um it it only it works for me because i'm so used to it and because i've been working with it for a decade now that i know the tips and tricks and i know how to ex make it exactly the way i want so i can manipulate it like a tool just like how i manipulate a paintbrush um, Procreate, I'm still new to and not used to it, which is why I don't go to it. Especially like if I had time to experiment and play around, hell yeah, I'll use Procreate, but it's just time limitations and stuff kind of force me to use Photoshop. If you if you were to ask um, some of our character design teachers, they would tell you, oh, without a doubt, Photoshop's the standard in that part of the industry. So there's places that it is and other places that it's not. Um, so, you know, I guess that's uh, that's just learning about how, uh, you know, the part of the industry you want to work in. All right. So, Catherine, this was phenomenal. Um, Thank you. I just loved having the conversation with you. Um, I love your work and uh, I'm very happy and proud that you that you teach with us. And you're just an incredible example of uh, somebody with a vision of what they wanted to do in the world as an artist and going after it and making it work. And thank you so much for doing this with me tonight. Thank you for having me. This was great. All right. Everyone have a great week. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much.